Greetings folks and welcome to another episode of Murder on the Tracks. And in this episode we're going to see a lot of things we haven't seen in previous episodes, including a lot more documents and we'll unredact quite a few of them as well. But what you're about to see is going to add a whole new level of shock to what is already a very shocking story. But before we begin, as I'm sure most of you are aware of, and as we saw at the very beginning of this video, sadly both Linda Ives and her daughter Alicia, Kevin's sister, passed away last year within two months of each other. And without going into it too much, I can tell you there was nothing nefarious about it. Linda had been really sick and in and out of the hospital for the last few years, as gradually her health declined. And Alicia also had her share of health issues, but a very tragic medical complication took her from us way too early. And of course this was a tremendous blow to Linda's husband and Kevin's father, Larry. But he's doing okay, as best as can be expected anyways, all things considered. Now we all know that Linda's been the long time driving force in the fight for truth and justice for Kevin and Don. But I can tell you right now that Linda's passing does not mean in any way that that fight is over. Far from it, in fact. Linda may have been the leader of our team, yes, but the team is carrying on, including Larry. The Murder on the Track series will continue on, revealing more and shedding light on the true aspects of the story. And I encourage you to visit the idfiles.com website. There we have thousands of documents, newspaper articles, videos, timelines, quotes, and so on, pertaining to the murders of Kevin and Don, and the cover-up that followed. It's there that you'll find anything official concerning Kevin and Don's story, and where you'll find most of the answers to your questions about it all. The site was originally created back in the late 90s by Linda Ives and Jean Duffy, hence the URL, I for Ives, D for Duffy, files, idfiles.com. And it's still being maintained by our team, and as I say, it's just absolutely loaded with info on the boys and what happened overall. And there's still a lot more to come. And that's going to start right here, in this episode, where we're going to have a look at the question, where's Don Henry's family? And it's a question I've heard asked here and there over the years, like how can we never hear from Curtis Henry, and so on. And we can see that question exemplified in the title of this Wall Street Journal article from 1996. So we can see already by that point, it's the lonely crusade of Linda Ives. Although of course she wasn't alone, as she had Larry with her the whole time, and Jean Duffy was working with her as well, side by side, fast becoming best friends. But we never hear from Don Henry's father, Curtis Henry. And as a matter of fact, on April 28, 2012, what would have been Kevin's 42nd birthday, the city of Alexander dedicated this bench in remembrance of the boys. It's nearing the 25th anniversary of his death on those Saline County railroad tracks. The crowd of people grew still during an impromptu moment of silence as a train passed by the Alexander City Park. It was on those tracks that Kevin and his friend Don Henry were found all those years ago. They were never given a thorough investigation of their murder. I would like for them to reopen it. And that day was the first time Linda and Curtis had spoken to each other in over 20 years. And it was the last time they spoke to each other as well, I do believe. And we'll see why later on. But notice what Curtis Henry said. I would like for him to reopen it. Absolutely. And we completely agree, of course. But I think that was the last time Curtis spoke out publicly about the boys. I started conversing with Linda around late 2016, a little before I put out the first Murder on the Tracks video, and have not heard a peep from Curtis Henry since that April 28, 2012 dedication. But this wasn't always the case. During the first couple of years after the murders, and state medical examiner Fami Malik's ridiculous ruling that the boys were asleep and unconscious, and under the psychedelic influence of marijuana, and didn't hear the train as it approached, both Curtis and his wife Marvell were partnered with Linda and Larry Ives in their fight for the truth, and just as visible in the public eye. And to note, like Kevin Ives, Don Henry had an older sister as well, Gayla Henry, who we'll see in a while. And Marvell was Don and Gayla's stepmother. Their real mother, and presumably Curtis's first wife, was Jenny Sue Carpenter, and she lived down in Florida. But indeed, at the beginning, Curtis Henry, with Marvell by his side, was just as vocal and visible to the public as Larry and Linda were. So what happened? And we have to set the stage first by going back to what we do know about what happened way back in the early morning hours of August 23rd, 1987. 
And to better understand things, we're going to revisit the best and most credible witness to events on the tracks that morning, Tommy Niehaus. And let's hear directly from Linda about Tommy and how he fits into the story. December 1993, a young man um, came forward to a friend of Kevin's. Uh, he was actually buying a car from him, and he started telling him about having witnessed what happened to Kevin and Don. This friend of Kevin's told me, he said, Whoa, you're talking to the wrong person. You need to talk to Kevin's mom. Tell her this stuff. And he agreed to talk with me, and um, um, Mike, his Kevin's friend, put us together. And he he told a, a pretty wild story, which included putting Dan Harmon on the tracks that night, which, you know, at that point I already suspected might very well be true. I turned him over to John Brown, who was a, a Saline County Sheriff's Office investigator at the time. He was working the case, and um, John Brown interviewed him, and he felt, just as I did, that it was certainly something that had to be checked out thoroughly. At the, at the time Kevin and Don were killed, he was only 12 years old, and he was 17 in 1993 when he came and talked with me for the first time. And so that certainly was, you know, in the back of my mind the whole time. But, and, you know, I was, I was really curious also as to why he would even know, um, number one, why would, he, why would he even be on the tracks, um, which the story went that he and two friends were there looking for a marijuana patch that they knew was planted near the tracks and happened to see a commotion going on on the tracks and started kind of creeping through the woods a little bit and trying to get up closer to see what was going on. And he um, named a number of people there, including Dan Harmon and others. I, I think I said people would recognize a number of the names. And and all of them rumored and or at known to be involved in drugs. At any rate, when John interviewed him, um, uh, he was in the process of trying to verify or discredit different elements of of Tommy's story. And, um, you know, another big curiosity of mine is how did he know a, the 17 or, at the time, 12-year-old child know who Dan Harmon was? Well, the answer was he dated his mother, was in and out of their apartment all the time. And some of the other uh, names that came up, were that um, people that lived in the same apartment complex, which I knew to be true. We talked. I turned him over to John Brown. John Brown was working on the information and happened to be um, at the Little Rock FBI headquarters one day amidst all of that and happened to mention this new witness that we had been talking to. And the agent that he talked to told him that they were very, very interested because of their public corruption investigation and the fact that some of that information corroborated information they already had on file. And so they brought Tommy Niehaus in. He agreed to go to the FBI, agreed to a polygraph, was polygraphed, and passed the FBI polygraph, placing certain persons there, including Dan Harmon. He not only passed the FBI polygraph test, but they put him in to protective custody in a Little Rock hotel. I have I have copies of the receipts and everything from the hotel. He didn't stay there, but a very short time. I can't remember exactly, maybe a couple of days, two or three days. And his mother would not cooperate. He was a minor still at the time. He was 17 years old. He was 12 the night he witnessed the murders, but he was 17 when we talked. And so um, he was still a minor and had to have parental permission for anything the FBI did with him. And she wouldn't, she wouldn't agree to keep him in protective custody. And that, that happened. I stayed in touch with Tommy for years until actually till the day he died. And the appearance of Tommy Niehaus coming forward in December 1993 is what started the federal FBI investigation into Kevin and Don's murders. And with that, FBI Special Agent Phyllis Cornyn was assigned the case. 
and one of the first things she did was contact Jean Duffy and with the Arkansas State Police, brought her back to Arkansas to help with the investigation. And immediately after that, Linda and Jean met for the first time and began comparing notes and became the best of lifelong friends. And I'd like to point something out. These three ladies, along with Mara Leverett as well, have been instrumental in getting to the bottom of the truth of both what happened to the boys and the cover-up that followed. And in today's day and age of the celebration of women's strength and integrity, etc., I have to say that these four ladies were leading the way decades ago. Trailblazers who've never wavered in their convictions for the truth. We should believe these four incredible women, yes? I do. And some people ask me how it is I know so much about the story, or how I have so many documents and so on. And of course that's because I've been both honored and blessed to become good friends with Linda and Jean over the years, and became part of the team. And I'll share a couple of emails that I've redacted, but as I say it's been an honor to be involved and included into Linda and Jean's tight circle of friends. And this email was a few months before we went down to Arkansas and spent a week with Linda, Larry, Alicia, Jean and James and a whole bunch of others, which at this point Jean was beginning to organize. Now unfortunately after that incredible week, and not right away but over time, Linda's health would start taking a downturn and our communications would begin to decrease. We stayed in touch online pretty well, but I tried not to pester her too much of course, though she would have said to call her any time. Linda would have her cell phone by the operating table if that let her. Now Jean on the other hand, well Jean and I talk all the time like best friends. She's been blessed to have good health, and her prosecutor's thinking cap is still as sharp as it ever has been. And together with her husband James, brother Mark, Larry Ives, and some others, we're going to continue Linda's pledge to Kevin all those years ago to get the truth out there about what happened. Officially, Kevin and Don's murders remain unsolved. But with the mountains of evidence suggesting otherwise, do you really believe that? Now because of my friendship with Linda and Jean, I've had the honor of conversing with Mara Leverett from time to time as well. And she not only just wrote the incredible book The Boys on the Tracks, released in 1999, but she'd been covering their story for years and years already. And if you watched my video American Remade, The Real Story of Barry Seal, then you'll most definitely want to buy Mara Leverett's new book, All Quiet at Mina. She's a brilliant and meticulous researcher, and absolutely glows with those same qualities as an author. Now I've not had the honor of conversing with Phyllis Cornyn, unfortunately, but for her efforts in uncovering some of the massive Saline County drug trafficking and corruption, and links related to the murders of the boys, much in the same way both Jean Duffy's task force and John Brown's initial investigations uncovered, Phyllis Corner would eventually be set up and run out of the FBI. And we'll eventually do an episode featuring Phyllis Cornyn's fight to get the truth out and her struggles within the FBI. But it was very nice to hear from her in the comments section of the first murder on the tracks a few months ago, where she wrote, Many investigators have tried to bring this very solvable case to a conclusion but are stopped in the process, vilified, and degraded. In the meantime, many involved in the deaths of these boys and the cover-up have been elevated so how do you like that? Two sentences of absolute pure truth. And Phyllis Corner knows exactly what's behind all those redactions in the FBI documents. Because she wrote most of them. So anyways, I just wanted to highlight these four incredible ladies and their efforts. They are the main reason we know so much about what happened to Kevin and Don. They could have done the easy thing and turned the other way, like so many others have. But they didn't and stuck to their guns at great personal cost too, like both Jean and Phyllis being run out of state and their investigative careers ruined. Now remember Linda mentioned about having the receipts for where they kept Tommy. He not only passed the FBI polygraph test, but they put him in to protective custody in a Little Rock hotel. I have, I have copies of the receipts and everything from the hotel. He didn't stay there but a very short time. I, can't remember exactly, maybe a couple of days, two or three days. And here's a copy, and I'll unredact the beginning, as I'm 100% positive it says. The confidential witness in captioned matter was housed at the LA Quinta Inn, 200 Shackleford Road, Little Rock, Arkansas, on the evenings of, and they have that redacted out, 1993, for his protection. And it's odd that they redacted the dates there, 
as right below we can see it was December 15th and 16th, 1993, which Linda knew that that's when the FBI had taken Tommy in. Same with this document, asking Tommy and his mother to go into the witness security program. On December 18th, 1993, Supervisory Special Agent, and that would be Robert Satkowski at that time, and Special Agent Redacted, and that could be Phyllis Cornyn's name under there, but I'm not sure. There's a number of possible special agents whose name would also fit there as well. But next, I'm pretty sure it says under there, LEO, or Law Enforcement Officer, John Brown, Saline County, Arkansas, Sheriff's Department, met with Tommy Niehaus and explained the witness security program. Niehaus advised, and there's a whole bunch of something he advised, but no further incidents have occurred which would cause him to be alarmed. Therefore, he displayed no interest in the witness security program. And below we see, the witness security program was also explained to Melanie O'Brien, mother of Niehaus, on the afternoon of December 18, 1993, over the telephone. Mrs. O'Brien advised that she did not feel that the witness security program was necessary, and that if the situation changed, she would contact the FBI. And remember that Tommy was only 12 years old at the time of the murders, and this caused Linda some concern. At the time Kevin and Don were killed, he was only 12 years old. And he was 17 in 1993 when he came and talked with me for the first time. And so that certainly was, you know, in the back of my mind the whole time. But, and, you know, I was, I was really curious also as to why he would even know, um, number one, why would, he, why would he even be on the tracks? Um, which the story went that he and two friends were there looking for a marijuana patch that they knew was planted near the tracks. And I actually can totally relate to Tommy, as here's a young me at the age of 13 years old in 1982 with a couple of my school classmates. The year before when I was 12, my two best friends, Tony and Mike, who happened to be 15 years old at the time, used to get me drinking and smoking dope. Tony's parents would go away on weekends and he'd throw parties, and I'd be the bartender, until I was too hammered of course, which wouldn't take too long really. Then they'd stick me in bed and Tony's girlfriend would call my grandfather, pretending to be Tony's mother, and tell him I fell asleep watching a movie, and then give me breakfast and send me home in the morning. We did that a whole bunch of times, or I remember plenty of times sneaking out at 1.30 or 2 in the morning on weekends and going to the all-night pizza place for a slice. So I can absolutely relate to Tommy being out in the early morning hours at the age of 12 with two 15-year-olds while they're looking for a weed patch. That's something I might have done had the opportunity presented itself. And look at my decor back then, my Van Halen necklace, ACDC and other bands on my sleeves, and on the back of my jean jacket were the big logos of my favorite bands at that time, Saxon, Iron Maiden, and Judas Priest. So do you suppose I had any other destiny than growing up into this guy? Anyways, going back to what Tommy was witness to in 1987, it's important to understand that there were three separate incidents that took place in the murders of Kevin and Don. At about 12.30 in the morning, Kevin and Don left Don's house, which was located here. The first of the three incidents happened somewhere approximately in this area, which is what Tommy Niehaus was witness to, where he saw five people on the tracks and Kevin and Don approaching them, and a shot went off and everybody scrambled. The second incident happened down here at a grocery store at Highway 111 in what was once Show Road, now renamed West Azalea Drive. And this is where witnesses describe two boys as being beaten by two police officers who are alleged to be Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell. And we're not going to get into it here, but it wasn't just Ronnie Godwin and Mike Crook who were saying the same thing. As we're going to see in a future episode, there were actually four witnesses to events at the grocery store that all corroborate each other. The third incident happened here, which is where Kevin and Don were placed on the railroad tracks sometime prior to 4.30 in the morning. Also, just to add, Charlene Wilson was sitting parked in a car approximately here, along Earl D. Miller Line, which back in 1987 extended a few hundred yards alongside the railroad tracks and ended beside a field, which is where Charlene witnessed Tommy and his two friends sprinting out of the tree line from as she sat in the car doing cocaine waiting for Dan Harmon. And what's important to understand is that Tommy was only witness to the first incident, 
where he saw five individuals on the tracks and recognized a few of them, and then a shot was fired and they all scrambled. So it's not only possible, but it's probable that not all of the same people Tommy saw were involved in all three incidents. It's likely that some of the five people Tommy saw were only involved in the first incident and took off, and that was it. Tommy didn't see or know about the second and third incidents, but it's likely that at least one person from the first incident was still there at the tracks during the third incident. And the color and oozing nature of the blood, plus the lack of any fresh blood at the scene, as witnessed and documented by both paramedics who attended the scene, suggests the boys were killed quite a while before being run over by the train, which might have happened sometime around the second incident. So, let's have a look at those five individuals from the first incident that Tommy was witness to. There was five individuals uh, standing on the tracks. One thing that struck my curiosity is, uh, at the time my mother was dating uh, an attorney named Dan, uh, Dan Harmon. I, I knew him well enough to recognize him. So I was 200% sure it was Danny Harmon, without any doubt. Without any doubt. And that footage of Tommy was taken while he was in the FBI's protective custody for those couple of days. Detective John Brown had gotten the footage from one of his contacts in the FBI and gave it to Linda. And as we saw in previous episodes of Murder on the Tracks, Dan Harmon would eventually go to jail for nine years in 1997, but only based on charges of what he had done while running the prosecutor's office. And below we can see an example of that. But the parameters for his trial didn't allow for any investigation or convictions for any of his crimes of the 1980s. I think that if the murder charge had been included in the RICO count as it should have been, there may very well have been a murder conviction today as well, and I'm very disappointed that, uh, and angry that the government refused to include that in their RICO count. Uh, I, I believe that the case deserves to be heard before a jury at least, uh, and I think the outcome could have been very similar today. He could have been a convicted murderer. And remember Linda mentioned about Tommy passing an FBI polygraph? And so they brought Tommy Niehaus in. He agreed to go to the FBI, agreed to a polygraph, was polygraphed, and passed the FBI polygraph, placing certain persons there, including Dan Harmon. And here's an FBI report about Tommy's polygraph, which states, based on the foregoing and the fact that confidential witness Niehaus passed a sheriff-requested polygraph on most of his statement, and what's meant by that is that Tommy passed all the questions on his polygraph except for one particular area. Which as we saw in Murder on the Tracks, Billy Jack Haynes versus Charlene Wilson, it was Tommy's attempts at not naming Keith McCaskill as being one of the people at the tracks that produced any negative results in his polygraph. He knew some of the names of the people at the tracks that he saw, but for some reason didn't want to name Keith McCaskill. But his polygraph results indicate McCaskill was there. And of course, as we've seen in previous Murder on the Tracks episodes, Keith McCaskill was murdered on November 10th, 1988, having been stabbed 113 times. McCaskill was a witness in the Bryant train deaths investigation. Although police haven't ascertained a motive for the murder, they say there's no connection. would link uh, this investigation to the deaths of Don Henry or Kevin Ives. And I don't foresee anything in, in uh, the pursuance of the rest of this investigation, it would be uh, anything that would uh, make me change my mind. What about uh, the murder? Is it connected at all with the uh, grand jury investigation? Not that we know of. And apparently the decision to not link Keith McCaskill's murders to the murders of Kevin and Don was made by authorities immediately. As we can see in this document, somebody contacted Unsolved Mysteries regarding the murder of Keith McCaskill. Blank advised that an immediate decision was made regarding no ties between the deaths of Henry Ives and McCaskill. And looking at this document, I wondered who Blank was, as it's either he or she. And that's when I realized who it probably was. She is the pronoun that more properly fits, and she would be Saline County Sheriff's Office Deputy Kathy Carty. Now, I don't know for sure if that's what it says and that's who they're talking about, but I'm pretty sure it's her for a few reasons. It's probably somebody in law enforcement that's making the call, as that's how they would have inside information that an immediate decision was made. The document redacted whether it was a he or a she, and the only reason to redact whether it's a he or a she would be to protect the identity of the very few she's that were in law enforcement in that area at that time, and in the possible position to know that an immediate decision was made. 
and of course Lane County Sheriff's Office Deputy Kathy Carty was one such law enforcement official. And it should be noted that she was the only one at the original investigation at the tracks that was trying to point out things like the color and texture of the blood, or that they shouldn't just be ruling it as an accident right off the bat. And in that footage, I can't help but wonder if that's Don Henry's shirt, as it was found some distance away from where the boys' bodies were. And then there's also that Kathy Carty and Keith McCaskill were good friends, despite being on opposing sides of the law. They had grown up together and Kathy knew that Keith was selling weed, but it wasn't huge amounts and she was overlooking that, as he was also an informant giving her tips here and there on certain stuff. So it totally makes sense to me that it's Kathy Carty underneath those redactions. And of course the font size and spacing fits perfectly as well. And we can see that an immediate decision was indeed made. In the Court of Appeals of Arkansas, in December 19, 1990, we see Ronald Shane Smith versus the state of Arkansas. While the police were investigating the scene of the crime, they were approached by Ronnie Smith, McCaskill's neighbor, who told them that his 19-year-old son, Shane, had witnessed the murder, and Shane's full name is Ronald Shane Smith, the same as his father's. Anyways, two days later on November 12th, they charged him, the son, with McCaskill's murder. And there you go, no connections to the murders of Kevin and Don. Except, of course, that Ronald Shane Smith didn't kill Keith McCaskill, and it was ridiculous to think that he did, which is how the Arkansas Court of Appeals ruled. And to this day, more than three decades later, no one else has been convicted regarding the McCaskill murder. And remember that, because perhaps we'll see why in a couple of minutes. But look at the redactions on that page. Out of this entire section, the FBI determined that we're only allowed to see the word advised. That's ridiculous. And all the areas of the documents concerning Keith McCaskill like so many of the documents concerning Kevin and Don, have huge blocked out areas in them, and are useless. Here's one that lets us know that Keith was playing with some heavy hitters. And here we see, there is located throughout this file, redacted, Pulaski County Sheriff's, redacted. Name is located regarding the death of Keith McCaskill. And that's really interesting as we see in this document. Redacted Pulaski County Narcotics is specifically, and there's a whole line of redacted stuff there, followed by redacted is also mentioned in these pages as an individual who is following Keith McCaskill. And what's really interesting is that using the same font size and spacing, the name Jay Campbell fits perfectly right here while the name Kirk Lane fits perfectly right here. And that's made even more interesting by this earlier Arkansas State Police report where club owner Mike Crook states that before Keith McCaskill was killed, McCaskill told him that Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell of the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office were following him around and he was afraid they were going to kill him. And remember that about Mike Crook and what he said Keith McCaskill told him. And here's another heavily redacted document that says Keith McCaskill also redacted. Then it says McCaskill redacted who killed Don Henry and Kevin Ives. And I'll take a stab at it that underneath that last redaction it says McCaskill also said he knew who killed Don Henry and Kevin Ives. And there would be your reason for why Keith McCaskill was murdered. And the manner in which he was murdered was a warning to others who might have valid information to keep their mouths shut. Keith McCaskill was a very popular guy and everybody knew he could more than handle himself in fights. So if they could kill him in such manner, and not only just get away with it with impunity, but also convict the poor dupe who was a witness who came forward, then that sends a pretty strong message. Now let's have a look at some of the officials who were involved in Ronald Shane Smith's conviction and Keith McCaskill's murder. And from Ronald Shane Smith's appeal, which he won, we see that it was Fammy Malik who did the autopsy on Keith McCaskill and the judge and the prosecutor in the district court who convicted him to 10 years were none other than Judge John Cole and Dan Harmon. And even though the appeals court reversed the decision, which released Ronald Shane Smith after spending a year in jail, he'd have to sweat it out for another year, waiting for Cole and Harmon to finally dismiss the charge, as in what's going on in this article here. Now in this article from the year before, when Ronald Shane Smith first won his appeal and was finally released from jail, 
It points out that Keith McCaskill had met privately with Richard Garrett and Dan Harmon, and this was the day before he was murdered. So how about that? Quite the coincidence that these four guys were also all involved in Kevin and Don's so-called investigations as well. And like Kevin and Don's murders, Keith McCaskill's murder remains unsolved up till this day. And of course, as you saw, any documents pertaining to Keith McCaskill's murder are heavily redacted, because like Kevin and Don's murders, we're still not allowed to know anything about that. Now how about this? Remember the Arkansas State Police report where Mike Crook said that Keith McCaskill told him that Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane were following him around and he was afraid they were going to kill him? At Ronald Shane Smith's trial in Judge Cole's chambers, a police officer testified that McCaskill told him 10 days before the murder that he was being followed by three men. And from Ronald Shane Smith's appeal decision, we can see that in his first statements to police when he came forward as a witness that he saw three men and clown masks knocking at the front door of McCaskill's house. And further, he saw one of the men, the blonde-headed one, stab McCaskill. And of course I can't help but wonder if that might possibly be Dan Harmon, with all his white tips and dirty blonde hair sticking out from under a mask. It's an interesting thought anyways. And going back to the 1991 article, check out what Ronald Shane Smith's mother said. I'm glad Dan was good enough to know that Shane wasn't guilty, after Harmon and Cole had already put him in jail for a year. And although I obviously disagree with the good part, I do agree that Dan knew that Shane wasn't guilty, of course. I think that Mr. McCaskill was probably suffering from a lot of paranoia. And right now the indications are that nobody else was involved. Might there have been a reason, though, for his paranoia? I'm sure there was a reason for his paranoia. Uh, because he had talked to the police or to the prosecutor? I don't know that that would be the reason. And we can see here that by March 8, 1994, at least six individuals who claim to have information concerning the deaths of Kevin Eyes and Don Henry have been murdered. Now remember Linda explained how Tommy knew who some of the people were that he saw at the tracks? And, um, you know, another big curiosity of mine is how did he know uh, the 17 or, at the time, 12-year-old child know who Dan Harmon was? Well, the answer was he dated his mother, was in and out of their apartment all the time. And some of the other uh, names that came up were that um, people that lived in the same apartment complex, which I knew to be true. Now, the next person that Tommy named and passed on his FBI polygraph in doing so is someone we've not brought up in previous episodes of Murder on the Tracks nor have Linda and Jean brought up his name before publicly in association with Tommy's polygraph, and we'll see why that is at the end of the video. But this person lived in the same apartment complex as Tommy, and that's how he knew who he was. Linda said people that lived in the same apartment complex, but she meant this one person. And that person that Tommy named in his FBI polygraph was James Freddie Poe, a known drug dealer. And there's not too much documentation on Freddie Poe, but what there is is pretty intriguing. Here's an Arkansas State Police report that says, The caller stated that his mistrust of the Sheriff's Office was due to Freddie Poe being a cocaine dealer and apparently having connections in the Sheriff's Office. Which sounds about right. And I find this report remarkable for a number of reasons, and especially in combination with knowing that Tommy passed an FBI polygraph naming Freddie Poe at the tracks. And in the report it states, the confidential informant also states that, redacted, Freddie Poe, who was into drugs real heavy, would possibly know who was picking up dope from that drop zone. Now remember this document, because we're going to come back and visit it later on. But right now we're going to take a little sidestep and talk about something that didn't exist. Or did it? The green tarp. Neither boy owned such a tarp. Who had covered them with it? And why? All four of the people on the train who were able to observe the scene prior to the accident stated that the boys were partially covered by a green tarp. Let's see what you can find. I'll go ahead and call it in. Police who searched the scene later denied that Engineer Schroyer had even told them about the tarp. They even questioned its existence. 
That, to me, would be like questions of the existence of the boys on the track. The tarp, however, was never found. Except that the tarp was found. But Saline County Deputy Chuck Talent, who was leading the initial investigation at the tracks, told the train crew that it must have been an optical illusion. Even when engineer Mike Tomlin went walking along the tracks looking for it and found it, and showed it to Chuck Talent. So what happened to the tarp? Tarp, however, was never found. Really? Because let's have a look at what the documents say. And this is from Sheriff Judy Pridgen, who was transferring some of the evidence from Kevin and Don's case. And she writes, This is all of the physical evidence known to us other than a shirt and a tarp retained by, and it's redacted, office in Atlanta, Georgia, presumably Dr. Burton's office, as we'll see. And here we see, Burton provided Special Agent Redacted with a copy of his pathological report, as well as Don Henry's t-shirt, and a piece of light greenish colored material believed to be part of a tarp. Burton said witnesses in the front engine of the train described seeing a tarp over the boys. Burton stated that the material was not documented or otherwise identified when it was sent to his office, so he just assumed it must be a piece of the tarp. Here's another report that states, enclosed for FBI laboratory are the following items, and at the bottom we see one piece of green cloth. And in the report detailing the results from the FBI lab, we see a list with the same items, minus the tarp. And on the next page we see, the results of the other requested forensic examinations will be furnished in a separate report. And that's the last we hear of the tarp. Tarp, however, was never found. So I think we can put to rest any notion that the tarp was an optical illusion. It was very much real, and the authorities kept it hidden and covered up. But knowing that there was indeed a tarp makes this document even more interesting. Because somebody advised that he tied a ski rope to the tarp and pulled the tarp off the boys as the train approached. So who might that somebody be? And this is only a guess, but again, based on the spacing and the font sizes. And this writer uses all capitals when using someone's name. But when I think of all the bad guys involved in this case, the one name that would fit there is Poe. And again, that's only a guess, but it is an interesting one. And we'll be seeing quite a bit more of Freddie Poe shortly, so keep this in mind. According to Tommy Niehaus's FBI polygraph, those were three of the people that he saw on the tracks. Two of them that he named, and one of them he tried not to name, which is the only part of the polygraph that he failed on. So that now leaves two other people that he didn't know who they were, which is something he also passed in the polygraph. But let's have a look now at who the last two people might possibly be. And we'll start with the strongest candidate, Bryant Police Officer Danny Allen. And we'll start with this interesting document that says, Attached to this memo is a radio log which reports, redacted, at 4.17 a.m. August 23rd, 1987, which is approximately anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes before the boys were run over by the train. And some of the things I find interesting about this document is that A, the FBI thought to document this radio log in a report, and B, they redacted a certain part of it. And as I explained in a previous Murder on the Tracks episode, when the FBI was finally forced to give Linda Ives and Mara Leverett a bunch of documents, even though heavily redacted, in some cases there were duplicates sent with different redactions, and this happens to be one of them. So in the same document, without the redaction, we can see, Attached to this memo is a radio log which reports Danny Allen's unit at his 1042 at 4.17 a.m. on August 23, 1987. And his 1042 was the code word for the end of his shift, as Danny Allen was on shift that night. So one of the things I find curious about this is the redaction, and exactly who was it meant to be redacted from seeing, meaning an internal source, or the release to Linda and Mara. And while I can't be sure, that redaction certainly looks like it's meant to keep Danny Allen's radio log a secret. At any rate, even though Danny Allen was at the end of his shift, he would report to the scene of the tracks. But apparently, before he went to the scene of the tracks, he went home to change his clothes. And unfortunately, I can't substantiate that with a document or anything like that, but it's something that Linda once told me. And Jean's familiar with this, as is Larry and some others. But Linda said she had talked to Danny Allen's wife over the phone. And this was like years later, like probably the early 1990s. And I do believe it was Danny Allen's ex-wife at that point. 
But anyways, during the conversation, Danny Allen's wife mentioned that he had come home to change before going out on the call at the tracks, to which Linda, of course, perked right up and started inquiring more about it. And she said that Danny Allen's wife kind of realized what she had said, and then didn't want to talk about it anymore, with the implication being that there was blood on his clothes. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes, but let's have a look at a few more documents that pertain to Danny Allen. And we know these documents are about Danny Allen because FBI agent Phyllis Cornyn told Lynn Dives all about it. And as a result, she got suspended for three weeks, followed by three months of probation for doing so. And here's Linda posting one of the documents to Facebook saying it was about Danny Allen who failed three polygraphs. And here's that same document. And we've unredacted this one before in a past episode of Murder on the Tracks, but we'll do so again here. And we can see the FBI agent who wrote this uses all caps when they use someone's name. And it says, For information of Little Rock, Danny Allen was polygraphed regarding knowledge of capturing the case on Thursday, December 15th, 1994. Danny Allen at the time of this incident, August 23rd, 1987, was a police officer from Bryant who reported to the scene of the train deaths, along with Saline County Sheriff's Department and Arkansas State Police on August 23, 1987. On the polygraph, Allen was asked specific questions regarding caption subjects' deaths. Although Allen proclaimed that he knew nothing, the results of his polygraph clearly indicated deception. Special Agent Redacted reported that Allen indicated strong deception regarding knowledge of who killed the boys, as well as who put the boys on the tracks. And as I've mentioned about that sentence in this document in the past, that's indicative of two different groups, as Danny Allen's polygraphs indicated that he knew who killed the boys, as well as who put the boys on the tracks. Now the next sentence I'm not fully sure of, for a couple of reasons. As it says, Redacted did advise Special Agent Redacted that he believed the Special Prosecutor Dan Harmon to be involved in the deaths of the boys. And although the font size and spacing fits, and there's plenty of documents where Dan Harmon is named as the Special Prosecutor in quotes like that, and it makes sense as well. But this also fits and makes sense, which would be Redacted did advise Special Agent Redacted that he believed Officers Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell to be involved in the deaths of the boys. So without some guidance from someone like Phyllis Cornyn, who I bet knows exactly what's underneath that redaction, we can only be left to guess. We could say something completely different. And remember this document as well, as we'll be coming back to it later on. But now let's move on to the next document concerning Danny Allen. And it says, Danny Allen is alleged to have been involved in the murder of Ives and Henry. A short time after the deaths of Henry and Ives, and then it's all redacted out because we're not allowed to know that. On December 15, 1994, Danny Allen was subpoenaed to the Little Rock office of the FBI to give hair, blood samples, and major case prints. Allen was asked to take a polygraph concerning his knowledge surrounding the deaths of Henry and Ives. Allen agreed to take a polygraph. After having been advised of his rights, interrogation, advice of rights, FD 395, and after having signed a waiver of those rights and after having signed a consent to take a polygraph form FD 328, Allen was polygraphed at the Little Rock office of the FBI. During the post-test, Danny Allen maintained that he had absolutely nothing to do with the deaths of Kevin Ives and or Don Henry. And then there's another big redacted section there. And below that we can see, Allen admitted that he did very little, if anything, to attempt to solve these murders. During the post-test, Danny Allen stated that he had lied during the polygraph about never having violated, and then we get into some more redacted stuff. Allen still continued to maintain his innocence and after several hours of being interviewed, asked if he would ever change the examiner's mind about being involved in the murders of Henry and Ives. When told that he would not change the examiner's mind, Allen got up and walked out of the interview room and refused to talk to the interviewing agents any further. During the pretest phase of the polygraph examination, Allen was asked why he was in the room and stated that he was there because he was stupid enough to have agreed to take a polygraph. Here we start out with a redacted sentence that has Danny Allen's name somewhere underneath it. And he submitted samples of blood and hair under subpoena and submitted to an FBI polygraph regarding involvement in the Ives-Henry situation. After three polygraph examinations, which all indicated deception, Danny Allen left the Little Rock office of the FBI. 
Examiners at the FBI laboratory advise that Allen's failure of these polygraphs indicates he is either involved in or a perpetrator of the crime. And we're going to look at some more documents with Danny Allen coming up. But there was also this episode that happened in June of 1988, almost a year after the boys were murdered. A videotape of the scene where two Bryant teenagers were struck by a train in August shows what appears to be a firearm that did not belong to the youth. While viewing a video made at the scene by a Kirk TV cameraman, Linda Ives, mother of one of the victims, and a Benton Courier reporter noticed what appeared to be a rifle or a shotgun lying in the bed of a railroad truck. When the object was highlighted Wednesday afternoon, television reporters said it was a single barrel shotgun or rifle. Chief Deputy Ray Richmond of the Saline County Sheriff's Office said today the object is not a weapon. Richmond has not seen the raw video footage. And here's the video footage they're talking about. And it's not Don Henry's rifle as his rifle was found broken in several pieces. And in this Arkansas State Police report, we see on the same day as the news article, June 16th, 1988. Right after the 6 o'clock news was over, Chief Deputy Ray Richmond of the Saline County Sheriff's Department telephoned this investigator and advised this investigator that what Linda Ives thinks is another gun in the back of a Pacific Union Railroad truck is his Cal flashlight. He stated that he had his flashlight and that when they were loading one of the bodies on the bed of the truck, he laid his flashlight down on the bed of this truck. And just to highlight, here's how long the actual item is in question, which extends a little bit past the highlighted circle shown in the news footage. At the top is the guy's hand with surgical gloves or something similar, and the bottom of the so-called flashlight extends down a little bit past beyond the circle. So that monstrosity is his flashlight? Well, you'll have to excuse me if I don't take his word for it, as he was one of the original law enforcement officials at the scene where Deputy Kathy Carty was the only one trying to point out that there were signs of foul play a group that was operating under Lieutenant Chuck Talent, who, if you'll remember, denied the existence of the green tarp, even after the engineers had walked over and pointed it out to him. And of course, the Saline County Sheriff, Jim Steed, lied about the tarp and said there was nothing at the scene that would make anyone think it was a homicide, which is rich coming from him as no one could find or get a hold of the good sheriff that day until around noon, and he never went to the scene of the tracks. And Saline County Chief Deputy Rick Almendorf would state after the murders, we haven't ruled out anything except foul play. And of course, after a couple of weeks, state medical examiner Fami Malik would come out with a ridiculous but official ruling and statement saying, At 4.25 a.m. on August 23, 1987, Larry Kevin Ives, 17, and Don George Henry, 16, were unconscious and in a deep sleep on the railroad tracks under the psychedelic influence of THC, or marijuana. Which of course is beyond a stupid thing to say, especially for a so-called medical professional but yet the corrupt Saline County law enforcement officials will accept that stupid ruling. So as I say, I'm not quite ready to simply take Lieutenant Ray Richmond's word for it, that it was his flashlight at the scene. And while I don't know if it was a gun or not, this is pretty interesting. Only three police officers at the scene would have had such a weapon in their possession at that time, and the first one they name is Bryant Officer Danny Allen. And remember FBI Special Agent Phyllis Cornyn told Linda Ives that Danny Allen failed three polygraph tests, and Danny Allen's wife told Linda that he had come home to change his clothes before he reported to the call at the tracks. Well, FBI Special Agent Phyllis Cornyn also told Linda that the FBI could prove, at the very least, that Allen helped lay the bodies on the tracks. And as I say, we'll come back to some more documents with Danny Allen, but let's have a look at who the fifth person at the tracks might have been. And remember, in previous Murder on the Tracks episodes, we've seen Billy Jack Haynes come forward, and between the various different versions of events that he told, he named all these guys as being on the tracks. and we've examined Charlene Wilson's alleged confession letter that named all these guys. And between the two of them, we learned that Billy Jack Haynes was full of BS and everything he said was a complete lie. Muscles on your shoulders and arms and no brains. Do you realize you're totally synthetic? You don't impress me. 
Look at yourself. You want to impress me. Who do you impress? Who do you want to impress, Billy Jackson? While Charlie and Wilson's so-called confession letter was more likely the product of John Brown and Sheriff Judy Pridgen's imagination when they were trying to go after Dan Herman. The only truth in it was Dan Herman drove Charlene Wilson and himself in Charlene Wilson's car to the tracks, where he left Charlene Wilson with a whole bunch of cocaine and was gone for a few hours. Both Linda and Jean believed all of this to be the case, and part of the reason for believing Charlene Wilson was in a car by the tracks is that she also said that while she was waiting there doing rounds of cocaine, she saw three kids running out from the tree line into the field. Two bigger kids first, with a smaller kid trailing behind and that was Tommy Niehaus and his two friends. And the only way Charlene Wilson would have known that is to be exactly where she said she was, when she said she was. So the only person we can safely take from her list, really, is Dan Harmon, though she did correctly name Keith McCaskill as well. But the more important point overall is that there's something in common about all these guys that Billy Jack Haynes and Charlene Wilson's confession letter names. And it's one of the things that was a bit perplexing when Billy Jack Haynes first came to Linda with his story. But the common thing about all these guys is that they're all guys. And the problem with that is that the fifth person that Tommy Niehaus saw during the first incident at the tracks in the early morning hours of August 23rd, 1987, wasn't a guy. It was a girl. And he passed the FBI polygraph about that point as well. And now here's where things are really going to start going down the rabbit hole. Because what if I told you that girl might just possibly have been Gayla Henry, Don Henry's sister. Now everything you're about to see, Linda of course knew about, and we talked about this quite a bit when I went down there in 2019 and spent a week with Linda and Jean, as I had a lot of questions about this when I went down there. And there's a reason I've waited until now to go over this material in the Murder on the Track series, but I'll explain all of that at the end. Right now, let's run through the documentation and I'm sure you'll be as shocked as I first was when I first processed it all. And in the Arkansas State Police reports, we learned some pretty interesting stuff. And here's an interview with Robert Davis, who was friends with Kevin and Don, and went to school with them. And he had heard a lot of rumors, and he also said that he heard that they're going to rip off the guy that was supplying Don's sister with her dope. And there's zero evidence that Kevin and Don were going to rip off Gala's then drug supplier, that was just one of the many rumors that had no basis in fact whatsoever. Here we see Jeffrey Bennett, who had known Kevin and Don for about four or five years, and he says he used to buy pot from Gala. Here we see Thomas Cloud Griffin, and remember him as we'll come back to him later on. But he knew Kevin and Don through Don's sister, Gala. And he says the last time he saw Don and Kevin was approximately 3.30 to 4 p.m. on the Saturday before they got killed, or roughly about 12 hours before. Griffin stated that Don Henry left the joint for Gala, and so he knew they had some marijuana. And like I say, remember Thomas Cloud Griffin, as we'll be coming back to him. Here's Darren O'Neill, a friend of Kevin and Don who knew Kevin for about four years and Don for about one year. According to O'Neill, Don Henry came over to his trailer on a couple of occasions, and on at least one occasion that he was sure of, he sold cocaine. O'Neill stated that he was on drugs real bad and that he does not remember who Don sold the drugs to. O'Neill stated that Jeff Madden and Eddie Griebel were at the trailer and it could have been one of them or several others that Don Henry sold the cocaine to. O'Neill stated that Don supposedly had a large connection for cocaine. O'Neill stated that he thought Kevin may have dealt some marijuana, but not cocaine. So Don Henry had connections to sell cocaine? He was only 16 years old, but it just shows you how right in the middle of Arkansas in the 1980s, how much cocaine was just overflowing in the area. Anyways, Darren O'Neill said that Don Henry might have sold the cocaine to Jeff Madden or Eddie Griebel. And here's the interview of Raymond Edward, or Eddie, Griebel. And he says he met Don Henry through Don's sister Gayla approximately 10 years earlier. And he stated that Gayla married his best friend, Chris Ballard. And remember that name as we'll see it come up again. Griebel stated that approximately four to five days before Don Henry died, that he saw Don outside Darren O'Neill's house. 
Griebel stated that he was going to Darren's and Don was leaving. Griebel stated that Don asked him if he needed any cocaine, and he told Don no, and Don stated something to the effect, let me know, I have plenty. Griebel stated that this is the first time that he knew that Don was involved in cocaine. Now here's the interview with Jeffrey Madden. I had smoked pot and did some cocaine with Don one time. I also bought some cocaine from Don one time last summer. I used to buy most of my dope from Gayla, Don's sister. Gayla was into dope real heavy. She not only sold drugs, she also used drugs pretty heavy. The last time I talked to Gayla, she told me that she had gotten off drugs and had stopped selling it also. So it was Jeffrey Madden that Don sold the cocaine to at Darren O'Neill's house. And Don's sister, Gayla, both sold and used drugs pretty heavy. And Gayla told Jeffrey Madden that she had gotten off drugs and stopped selling? This doesn't seem likely as fast forward to December 2013, and we see Gayla Henry, 46, of Magnolia, was arrested Monday by the Arkansas State Police. She is charged with possession of a controlled substance, methamphetamine, possession of drug paraphernalia, and several misdemeanor offenses. So unfortunately, it looks like Gayla Henry spent her whole life surrounded by drugs. And Don doing and selling cocaine? I have no doubt that Gayla, his older sister, had an influence on him in this regard. Now what about their father, Curtis Henry? How might his two kids have gotten so messed up into drugs, and not just pot, but heavier drugs including cocaine? And to Linda's surprise, and mine as well, Curtis Henry was quoted as saying that James Calloway had come by the Henry's house frequently in the days after the murders to ask how the investigation was going. Henry said that he knew the used car dealer quite well, and he suspected that Calloway probably knew something about who was involved in the boys' murders. And that's a huge rabbit hole to go down, and in a future murder on the tracks, we'll go down it. But Linda, Jean, Phyllis, and so on, do not believe that Calloway had anything to do with the boys' murders. That claim originates from Dan Harmon. Anyways, here we can see James Calloway saying, My oldest daughter and Don Henry were good friends who had known each other all through school. We lived five houses down from him on the same side of the road. Now why the surprise by Linda? Because he was car salesman James Calloway was a well-known cocaine trafficker and convicted felon and was actually good friends with Dan Harmon and Richard Garrett. And remember Gayla's drug supplier mentioned earlier in that rumor about the boys going to rip him off. I believe this to be James Calloway, which makes sense considering Curtis Henry and James Calloway are good friends. And James Calloway wasn't the only drug dealer that Curtis Henry was good friends with. As we can see here about Keith McCaskill, Henry noted that he and McCaskill had been good friends. Keith would tell him what he had just found. He said that he was sure that Keith had been killed because of what he had learned. And that much I do agree with. So when trying to understand how Don Henry and Gail Henry could have been so involved in drugs, it becomes quite apparent when you look at who some of Curtis Henry's friends are. And here's another point of interest about Curtis Henry when the grand jury was investigating the boys' murders. When the grand jury sought to question Don Henry's sister Gayla about her contact with the boys before their deaths, Curtis Henry refused to disclose where Gayla was now living. And this was a big issue as Curtis Henry had hidden Gayla away by sending her to live with her mother down in Florida within a few days of the boys' murders and refused to tell anyone where she was. So right from the get-go after the murders, no one had been able to interview Gayla Henry, which became a request by the grand jury through the Arkansas State Police to have Gayla return to Arkansas, which is something Curtis Henry still refused to do. But he would relent somewhat in July of 1988, 11 months after the murders, and while still not revealing Gayla's location, he set up a phone interview between the Arkansas State Police and Gayla. And I won't read her entire interview, but rather go through a few points, but I'll post the entire thing so you can pause and read it at your leisure. And right off the bat I see this. Dawn came by Freddie Poe's cousin's house where she was at. And we'll see what she has to do with Freddie Poe shortly. And on the Saturday before the murders, Dawn came over to her house before he went to pick up Kevin.
She did not see Don again because that night she took Freddie Poe's child to the Benton speedboat. And Miss Henry stated that Freddie Poe was supposed to be at a guy's house in Benton. But don't forget, five years later Tommy Neho said Freddie Poe was on the tracks that night with a girl. So one of them is not telling the truth. And Tommy passed an FBI polygraph on this point. My opinion about this is that it looks to me like Gail has given Freddie Poe an alibi while she herself is saying that she was watching Freddie Poe's kid. Here she says Don called her one day from Cloud Griffith's house. Miss Henry stated that usually if Don was going to buy marijuana he would buy it from her or Cloud Griffith's. And remember we saw Thomas Cloud Griffin earlier. But he stated that he had never sold Don or Kevin any kind of drugs. Further on, Miss Henry stated that Don never said anything about owing anyone money for drugs and he had a job and he usually had money. Miss Henry stated she never heard him say anything about ripping anyone off for drugs. According to Miss Henry, she didn't hear him say anything about a drug drop in Alexander, but she does remember him saying something about the ultimate dealer who was supposed to be a subject out of Little Rock. And the ultimate dealer she's talking about would be Marvin Stiegel, a cocaine trafficker in Little Rock who more than likely James Calloway didn't like, but who Dan Harmon was also friends with. And we'll go into all that in another episode of Murder on the Tracks. But back to the grand jury looking into Kevin and Don's murders. In June of 1988, we see giving testimony is Freddie Poe. And he also happens to be Gayla Henry's ex-boyfriend. So now we know why Gayla was staying at Freddie Poe's cousin's house. Now let's have a look at this Arkansas State Police report from about two weeks before on June 9th, 1988. And the day before on June 8th, witness Norman Tucker stated this. A year ago this past spring, before the train ran over Don Henry and Kevin Ives, I was traveling on Shoal Road from the interstate going to Bryant and it was around 10.30 or 11 p.m. when an airplane flew over the road in front of me. It scared me because I first thought it was going to crash. There was a field on my left side and as I passed this field I observed someone standing in the field up next to Shoal Road that had a flashlight with an orange end on it like the police used to direct traffic. At that point I realized the airplane was landing in this field. So Norman Tucker says he saw a plane landing in this private field around 11.30 or 12 before the boys were murdered. Might he have been witness to the drug drop that Kevin and Don stumbled across? Another request by the grand jury was to determine the owner-operator of the private airfield in the immediate vicinity of the incident. Interview this individual as to the use of the airstrip, determine if this person has any current or previous criminal record. And remember what Gene Duffy's drug task force would find out two years later in 1990. About three months after the drug task force was up and running, one of my undercover officers asked if he could open a, the train deaths case. He said that there were drug drops, apparently, coming from airplanes in that area. And these uh, drug drops from airplanes had virtually not been investigated by any of the law enforcement agencies in our district. And he thought that was something that our task force needed to look into. He said the drug drops were being made in the exact vicinity where Kevin and Don had been murdered. Now remember this document that we looked at earlier that stated Freddie Poe, who was into drugs real heavy, would possibly know who was picking up dope from that drop zone? Well, here's the original without the redaction. And it states, The confidential informant also states that Gayla Henry, who is sister to Don Henry, and her ex-boyfriend Freddie Poe, who was into drugs real heavy, would possibly know who was picking up dope from that drop zone. Pretty interesting how the one version has the information about Gayla Henry redacted. My guess is that that was the only version that was meant to be released to Linda. But both Gayla Henry and Freddie Poe would possibly know who was picking up dope from that drop zone? Considering everything we've seen so far about Gayla and drugs and her relationship to Freddie Poe, that doesn't sound too surprising now, does it? And as we can see by one of Gayla's Facebook posts in 2011, she and Freddie Poe would develop a lifelong friendship. 
Now remember earlier I mentioned that the ceremony in 2012 dedicating the marble bench to the boys was the first and only time that Linda Ives and Curtis Henry had seen or even spoken to each other in over 20 years by that point. From author Don Jeffries, I exchanged a number of emails with Linda Ives, mother of Kevin, starting in June 2009. She confided that she had never been supported by Don Henry's father, Curtis, in her efforts to find out what really happened to the boys. She received anonymous calls in which Don's sister, Gayla, would be mentioned as knowing what was going on. Linda told me all about this as well, and when Linda first brought this up with Curtis, he went ballistic, and that's what started the split between them. And remember Curtis shipped off Gayla down to her mother's in Florida and refused to tell anybody where she was. He said that he had sent her away soon after the boys were killed for fear that she would be killed too. In an interview in 1996, Curtis Henry stated, I refused to tell the grand jury where my daughter was. I left the house to go to the grand jury. I told Marvell that if I didn't come back to call the TV, because I had no intention of telling the grand jury anything. I mean, if they killed the brother, are they going to let the sister walk? And there's a few points about this that make me really wonder, what did Curtis Henry know? Like who are they? And why would they want to kill Gayla Henry? Remember Gayla told the Arkansas State Police that she was babysitting Freddie Poe's kid and took him to the Benton speedboat races. So they would want to kill her for that? Or is the more likely scenario that she was indeed on the tracks that night with Freddie Poe and she knew what happened? Remember this document from earlier with the interview of Eddie Griebel, where he stated that Gayla married his best friend, Chris Ballard. Well, a source told Arkansas State Police Sergeant Barney Phillips that on the same morning that Kevin and Don were killed, I think it was around 8 a.m. we were asleep in the trailer when Chris Ballard came by and told us that Don and someone else had been run over by a train and killed. I asked Chris how did he know, and he said he had talked to Gayla, Don's sister, who was also Chris's ex-wife, and that she told him. So Gayla already knew by 8 in the morning that the boys were run over by a train? How could she know that already? Curtis Henry said he had woken up around 4 a.m. and noticed Don wasn't home. So he says he got dressed and drove around looking for the boys, didn't find them, and at 10 a.m. he returned home to call Linda. And that's when he told her that he let the boys go out hunting after midnight and they hadn't come back yet and he didn't know where they were. He also told Linda he was going to take Gayla with him to look around some more. Still, it was obvious that something was up. When asked later why he hadn't searched for the boys on foot in the area where he knew they'd been hunting, Curtis could not explain. Maybe it just wasn't intended was the best he had to offer. So Curtis didn't bother going to look in the one area that he knew that the boys had gone? Really? It was 12 noon when Curtis called Linda back saying, Get over here quick, he said. They've been shot and tied to the railroad tracks and run over by a train. And remember that as we'll visit these words again. Now remember the document we looked at that said Danny Allen's polygraph indicated strong deception regarding knowledge of who killed the boys, as well as who put them on the tracks? In the paragraph below, we see, Unsolved Mysteries is currently running an old film clip which was made shortly after the boys' deaths. Featured on the tape are Danny Allen, Richard Garrett, and Curtis Henry. In light of a possible law enforcement cover-up, it is requested that the FBI remake a tape on Unsolved Mysteries to replace the current tape running, which never happened. So featured on the tape are Danny Allen, Richard Garrett, and Curtis Henry, and they mention a possible law enforcement cover-up. And in this document, we can see Saline County Prosecutor Richard Garrett, Investigator Danny Allen, and the father of Don Henry appeared on a segment of Unsolved Mysteries. The segment still appears periodically on television. FBI Little Rock sent a copy of the tape to the Behavioral Science Unit at Quantico due to Allen's possible involvement. The results of the unit's review were inconclusive. And again, they mention Richard Garrett, Danny Allen, and Curtis Henry or the father of Don Henry has appeared on the segment of Unsolved Mysteries. Only this time, instead of mentioning law enforcement, they mentioned Danny Allen's possible involvement. 
So, in this document we see, when the Unsolved Mysteries tape was made, the individuals featured on the tape were, and then they have it all blocked out. But of course, as we just saw, we know whose names are underneath that reduction. Danny Allen, Richard Garrett, and Curtis Henry. And it's pretty interesting that this time, their names are redacted. Why might that be? Looking at the next sentence, it says, It is now believed that all of these individuals are connected in the cover-up investigation regarding the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. So how about that? We went from possible law enforcement cover-up to Danny Allen's possible involvement to now all of these individuals, which includes Curtis Henry, who the FBI now believes is connected in the cover-up investigation of his own son. And the FBI was indeed suspicious of Curtis Henry and what he knew. In this document we see, based on this information, writer, who I believe to be Phyllis Cornyn, believes that the following interviews need to be conducted. And going down to point number four, underneath the redaction, it says, Curtis Henry, the father of victim Don Henry. Curtis Henry, during the FBI investigation, was believed to be suspect for a number of reasons, to include overnight financial gain, inconsistencies in statements given to authorities, and total avoidance of requests made by writer and assistance of locating and interviewing, and then it's all redacted. But I'm positive underneath that redaction somewhere is the name Gayla Henry. And notice they mention overnight financial gain. In late 1989, Curtis Henry suddenly came into some money. He opened up his own business selling heavy machinery, bought a new truck, and eventually bought a house in Magnolia, and no one quite knew how he could suddenly afford it all. And also notice by 1995 he's still hiding Gala, this time from the FBI. By April 10, 1996, the FBI had taken Phyllis Cornyn off the case, and by this time she was already deep into legal battles against the FBI, eventually being on her way to being run out of the FBI. And about the FBI investigation into Kevin and Don's murders, it is further requested that the supervisor, who is Ivy and C. Smith, decide if pending leads be investigated. If leads are not investigated, then the case investigation should be decided by the decision of Assistant United States Attorney's Office. And below that we see, any agent reassigned this case needs to be very cognizant of the media involvement in this case. Linda Ives, mother of victim Kevin Ives, has been very vocal, accusing the investigative agencies of a cover-up in case investigation. Any agent reassigned this case needs to maintain a distance with Linda Ives and report any contacts made by Linda Ives directly to a supervisor. On April 18, 1996, the Wall Street Journal would publish this huge article chronicling the incredible events in Linda's fight for justice up until that point in time. So that was April 18, 1996. Then, a month later in May of 1996, we see this. Curtis Henry, father of victim Don Henry, telephonically expressed his gratitude for the FBI's efforts in captioned matter. On May 17, 1996, Curtis Henry, father of victim Don Henry, telephonically contacted the Little Rock office of the FBI and requested to speak with this agent. He told me that he was most appreciative of the time and resources provided by the Bureau in its attempt to answer the many questions concerning the death of his son. He was also angered by the ongoing efforts of Linda Ives, mother of victim Kevin Ives, to quote, hurt the FBI in the press, end quote, and offered to provide a statement to the media expressing his satisfaction with the professionalism displayed and the services provided by the Bureau, if this would be acceptable to the FBI. So he's angered by Linda's efforts, even offering to make a statement expressing his satisfaction at the professionalism displayed and the services provided by the Bureau? Well, let's have a look at some of that professionalism and those services. And Curtis Henry wouldn't have known about this at the time. But only a couple of weeks earlier, on May 2nd, 1996, Ivy and C. Smith, head of the FBI working out of the Little Rock office, wrote to U.S. Attorney Paula Casey, saying, While there are indications of misconduct within the Saline County criminal justice system, these have not developed into offenses that warrant further federal investigation into the deaths of Ives and Henry. It is my recommendation that the FBI conduct no further investigation into this matter. And that's pretty much what would happen. There would be no more investigation, though the case was still officially open. Then about a year and a half later, on December 18, 1997, 
Mara Leverett would file a Freedom of Information request. With this letter, I am formally requesting access to all of the agency's files relating to those deaths. In the next month, on January 21, 1998, the FBI replied to Merrill Everett stating, Headquarters located no records responsive to your Freedom of Information Privacy Act request. So how do you like those services provided that Curtis Henry seemed so satisfied with? A couple weeks later, on February 2, 1998, Ivy and C. Smith, now wanting to close the case, would write U.S. Attorney Paula Casey, saying, We cannot state with certainty a murder even occurred. And how do you like that for professionalism? And the case was closed the next day, on February 3, 1998, and the battle to get the documents released would continue on. And by July 2000, the FBI would finally be forced to admit that there are approximately 16,600 pages responsive to Merrill Everett's request for all materials related to Kevin and Don's murders, out of which Merrill Everett and Linda Ives would only receive about 2,000 pages, which make up the bulk of the documents we examine here in the Murder on the Track series which as we've seen, almost all of them either have heavy redactions in them, or they're just completely blacked out entirely. On November 11th, 1996, while publicly blasting Detective John Brown, Curtis Henry had this to say. Even I've been accused of doing it, killing the boys, Henry said. Even some of the officials involved in the investigation, like Dan Harmon, have been accused of it. And just below he says, there's no way Dan Harmon had anything to do with it. He and Richard Guerra both worked their butts off trying to solve it. <laughs> Indeed, and on the surface of it, it appeared like they were trying to help, and even had Linda fooled for a few years. But the reality was that they got the grand jury impaneled so that they could control and steer the investigation. And here's some examples of Harmon and Guerra working their butts off trying to solve it, as Curtis Henry put it. Benton Chief of Police Rick Almendorf, Judge John Cole, and Dan Harmon were at Judge Cole's residence when Dan Harmon suggested that he be made special prosecutor for the Ives Henry case. Judge John Cole was paid to appoint Dan Harmon as a special prosecutor in the Ives Henry case. Special Prosecutor Harmon and Assistant Richard Garrett requested assistance from the Arkansas State Police, yet continuously withheld information from them. It appears that the special prosecutor appointed in this case, and we know that's Dan Harmon, may have misused his authority and disregarded other leads that may have assisted efforts to bring this investigation to a logical conclusion. Lastly, it also appears that certain Saline County officials may have conspired to cover up the investigation into the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. After this murder was aired on Unsolved Mysteries, Harmon put Richard Garrett in charge of all leads. Individuals would call in with information, and a formal statement was never taken. The individual would then be threatened by telephone to keep his or her mouth shut. So how do you like all that for working their butts off trying to solve it? Curtis Henry would also say, It looks to me like if you don't have any proof, you ought to just keep your mouth shut and let the real professional investigators handle it, he added. Real professional investigators like this, perhaps? On May 14, 1997, Dan Harmon was finally indicted on 11 counts. On June 11, 1997, he was convicted on five of those counts, including racketeering, extortion, and drug charges. Incredibly, during Harmon's trial, Curtis Henry would give testimony on behalf of Harmon as a character witness. He was asked, did you ever during these times see Mr. Harmon using drugs? To which he answered, no, I did not. Did you ever see him with any drugs in his possession? Curtis Henry answers, no, I did not. Have you had occasion through your work in your life to be around people who do use drugs? And in Curtis Henry's answer, he says, yes, I've been around a lot of them. Like his two kids, Gayla and Don. Or how about his two good friends and drug dealers, James Calloway and Keith McCaskill? Then Curtis Henry is asked, and the times that you spent with Mr. Harmon, was there anything about him that ever caused you to suspect that he used? Drugs? And Curtis Henry answers, I never noticed anything that made me think he did. Have you ever known him to be dishonest with you, 
and Curtis Henry answers, not to my knowledge. And I find that to be very interesting and very believable, as I believe it's very possible that Dan Harmon told Curtis Henry everything he knew about what happened that night on the tracks, but we'll look at that coming up. But back to his testimony. Okay, can you describe his demeanor and his dealings with you? And Curtis answers, he's always shot me a straight line that I know, that I know of, and we've worked everything out, you know, pretty well. He knew what he was talking about, you know. So Curtis Henry defended Dan Harmon right to the end. And I guess it makes sense considering they had everything worked out pretty well. And what they worked out pretty well is just one of the many questions we're left with. When you piece together a lot of the stuff we've looked at, it paints a pretty ominous picture. Curtis immediately hid Gayla away down in Florida to live with her mother, only days after the murders, as he was afraid they were going to kill Gayla too, saying, I mean if they killed the brother, are they going to let the sister walk? And to me, that just screams the question of, why would they want to kill Gayla? And of course the one thing that makes sense is that she was on the tracks and knew too much. And after having hidden her away in Florida and refusing to let anyone talk to her or even know where she was, Curtis Henry finally arranged a phone interview with the Arkansas State Police in Gala, which would be the only interview done with her. And on the Saturday night in the hours before the murders, she said she took Freddie Poe's child to the Benton Speedboat races. But she also said that Freddie Poe was supposed to be at some guy's house in Benton, who she didn't know the name of, of course. But don't forget that Tommy Niehaus passed an FBI polygraph naming Freddie Poe on the tracks, as well as a girl. Linda Ives would get phone calls telling her that Gayla knew what was going on. And we see documents that say Gayla Henry and Freddie Poe would possibly know who was picking up dope from that drop zone. And if you remember, Gayla Henry's name at some point was redacted for some reason. And Gayla told her ex-husband Chris Ballard sometime before 8 in the morning that Don and someone else had been run over by a train and killed. So how could she know that at that time? Looking back to Curtis Henry again, once united with Linda Ives, he's now against her efforts. The FBI says Curtis Henry is believed to be suspect, and they're not talking about him being a suspect in the murders. They're talking about his actions being suspect during their investigation, and they list overnight financial gain, inconsistencies in statements given to authorities, and avoidance of requests by the FBI to locate and interview his daughter, Gayla. And that was in 1995, seven years after the murders and Curtis Henry is still hiding Gala down in Florida, not letting anybody interview, even the FBI. Now why would that be? And by 1996, when everyone else knew by that point that Dan Harmon was a drug dealing criminal and was likely involved in some manner with the deaths of Kevin and Don, Curtis Henry still defended him. And why might Curtis Henry defend Dan Harmon? As we saw him say in his testimony during Dan Harmon's trial, we've worked everything out. And some might wonder, how can you work everything out with someone who killed your boy? And the answer to that is that Dan Harmon didn't actually murder Kevin and Don. He was an accessory to murder, yes, but he likely isn't the one that actually killed them. Linda and Jean have always believed that it was Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell that did the actual killings. I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind what the facts were and that Linda and I are absolutely convinced that um, the plaintiffs were the hands-on killers. And even though Curtis Henry was against what Linda was doing in her efforts for years, he knew the basics of what happened to Don and Kevin as early as 1988. I basically think that they walked up on something that they was not supposed to see. They was at the wrong place, at the wrong time. I know in my own mind that they was murdered and put there. Now to try and make some sense of all this, let's have a look at how it possibly all played out. Kevin and Don left Don's house at around 12.30 a.m. to go out hunting. Some time later, as witnessed by Tommy Niehaus, the first incident takes place. According to Tommy Niehaus's FBI polygraph results, Dan Harmon, Freddie Poe, and Keith McCaskill were there. And a girl was there, possibly Gayla Henry, and another individual, perhaps Danny Allen. 
though it could just as easily be Richard Garrett or Sheriff James Steed. In the distance, Kevin and Don come walking along, and as they get closer, a shot is fired and everybody scrambles. Keith McCaskill probably took off and called it a night, as did Kayla Henry, who went home, accompanied by Freddie Poe to make sure she gets home safely. And at this point, she doesn't know it was her brother Don and Kevin, as she probably only saw two silhouetted figures with a flashlight pointed in her direction. Dan Harmon and Danny Allen, or whoever else it might be with Dan Harmon, put out the call to apprehend the two guys on the tracks, because as Curtis Henry said, They walked up on something that they was not supposed to see. This brings us to the second incident at the Ranch Egg Grocery Store, where witnesses say Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell caught them, severely beat them, threw them in the back of their car, and drove off. And to note, Keith Coney, one of Kevin and Don's friends, was allegedly with Kevin and Don when Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell showed up, and he took off on his motorcycle. And we'll come back to him in a couple of minutes. But now we go to the third incident where Kevin and Don were run over by the train. And it's more than likely that Dan Harmon was still there, as Charlene Wilson, who was sitting in her car waiting for him and doing piles of cocaine, told Jean Duffy that she was there for hours. Danny Allen was very more than likely there for the third incident, as we seen earlier, and it would make sense that Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell were there as well, after having brought back Kevin and Don from the second incident, and they may have already been dead by this point. As documented by both paramedics who arrived at the scene immediately after the train ran over the boys, and Saline County Deputy Kathy Carty, Kevin and Don's blood was purplish and oozing, and there was no fresh blood at the scene, indicating that they had been dead for some time prior to the train running over them. Also there during the third incident is Freddie Poe, having returned back to the scene after taking Gala home, and this is probably when he finds out that one of the boys is Gala's brother, Don, which would explain how Gala knew before 8 o'clock in the morning that Don and someone else had been run over by a train. During this time frame, according to Curtis Henry, he said he woke up around 4 in the morning, noticed the boys weren't there, and drove around the streets for a few hours looking for them. But oddly enough, he didn't look in the one place where he knew where they went. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, he went back home and called Linda, telling her the boys went out hunting after midnight, haven't returned yet, and he doesn't know where they are. And he said he was going to take Gala and go around and look for them some more. And it might be around this time that he confronts Gala and can tell something is wrong. And then Gala, in a completely panicked state, tells Curtis what she knows. Then Curtis calls Linda back around 12 noon, saying, Get over here quick. They've been shot and tied to the railroad tracks and run over by a train. And of course they hadn't been shot or tied to the tracks, but this may have been how Curtis first understood whatever it was that Gala, in her shattered state, told him. She was there when the first gunshot rang off and everyone, including herself, took off. And remember that document that we looked at where it could possibly say that Freddie Poe tied a rope to the tarp? Freddie might have told her everything that he found out and what he did himself when he went back to the tracks, which would maybe include telling her that the boys were already dead by the time he got back there and who likely did it. So Gala, already panicked and in shock, tells Curtis a garbled version of what she thinks happened, that the boys were shot, tied to the tracks, and then run over by a train, and that's what Curtis said to Linda when he called her at noon. Now, because of what Gala knew, within days Curtis would ship her off to Florida to live with her mother. On April 27, 1988, the grand jury would be formed. A few weeks later, on May 17th, Keith Coney was killed. And remember, Keith Coney was allegedly with Kevin and Don at the Ranch Egg Grocery Store and took off when Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell showed up. Keith McCaskill would be murdered next, followed by Greg Collins, Daniel Bearden, Jeff Rhodes, and Jordan Kettleson. And Keith Coney was friends with Greg Collins, Daniel Bearden, and Jeff Rhodes. And Jordan Kettleson, rumor has it, knew information about Keith McCaskill's murder. And when you look through the FBI documents that Mara and Linda got, you see some other names that may, or may not, have been related in some manner. Now something to keep in mind is that all of this is speculation. But speculation based on the information available. Information that strongly suggests that both Curtis Henry and his daughter Gayla knew a lot more than they ever told anyone. And information that also suggests that Gayla was at the tracks during the first incident. Linda Ives knew all of this, 
And as I mentioned earlier, I had a lot of questions about Curtis and Gala when we went down and stayed with Linda and Jean for a week in 2019, and Linda explained it all. It's not something she's brought up publicly in decades because she knew if she did so, first of all, Curtis would go ballistic again, like he did the first time when she brought it up in the late 1980s, which in part started their decades-long silence with each other. And she also knew if she went down that road in public, the news media would just call her a crazy lady who can't get over the death of her son. This is why we've never covered this aspect in previous Murder on the Tracks episodes. But with Linda's passing last year, I spoke with Jean and we agreed that we should explore this avenue. And here we are. Remember, even the FBI had suspicions about Curtis Henry. So what did Curtis and Gayla really know? And for now, you'll have to decide that for yourselves. But I bet we'll learn a great deal more about exactly what happened to Kevin and Don if the FBI weren't so intent on keeping it all secret. Still, 35 years after their murders.